Voices from the Mausoleum is brought to you by the You Run Podcast Network and yourunpodcast.com. And while we still have your attention, be sure to check out the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast, available where all podcasts are downloaded. Uh, the podcast all about consumption, beer, music, movies, TV, nothing is off limits. They're really fun. Go check them out. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Voices from the Mausoleum. We have a very special interview here for you. Uh, joining with me today to discuss the new horror anthology, Escalators to Hell, Shopping Mall Horrors, we have Jennifer McArdle, uh, who's the co-editor. And we have uh, J.A.W. McCarthy, who is one of our featured authors. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hey, um, this just want to just sorry. This anthology is a blast. I, I love an anthology with a with a solid theme, um, and there's just so much to explore when we look at malls, specifically like malls in America, and like sort of like the state of where malls are actually kind of it's a it's a very interesting sort of um, glimpse into a very specific part of you know our experience. Um, so I want to just sort of do like a little. Uh, Roundtable introduction. Um, uh, Jennifer, why don't we start with you? Jennifer McCarl, we'll say. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, you know, give us a little bit of, like, what you do outside of uh, this anthology and, and sort of, yeah, what leads you up to it. Um, yeah, so I actually, this is my, the first um, fiction anthology that I've, I've edited. Um, and I was really um, honored that, that Mike, from From Beyond, who's the owner of From From Beyond Press, um, uh, had asked me to work on this project with him. Um, previously, I've written a lot of short stories, um, a little bit of nonfiction, um, and I've been published in a few uh, semi-pro and uh, token-paying markets. So I'm not—I wouldn't say I have like a huge, famous catalog or anything, but I, I was very much in the short fiction world, um, and. Yeah, in my day job, I work as a grant writer in animal conservation. So it's kind of a little background on me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love the the animal conservation. We're actually we're thinking of doing um, an anthology ourselves where we're going to, this is, I guess, a little tease for what we're going to do, but um, it's going to go towards like like a wolf sort of um, conservation. So it's a, it's a beautiful cause. Grant writing, that's a specific skill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's nice to, to switch between the, the different type. Cause like during my day job, I'm like reading all these like scientific reports and then, you know, like, and then I get to read, you know, these stories that go in all different crazy directions. So it's, it's good. Yeah. Get a sort of a break. I skipped the grant writing class in my graduate social work studies. So <laughs> I was like, that's not going to be my wheelhouse. So <laughs> yeah. I commend you for doing that. <laughs> uh, and Jen, well, J A W, should I, what, do you want? Do you prefer a short? Um, Jen is fine. If you want to keep it J A W to make it more clear, that's fine too. Yeah, well, J A W. I think that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but your writing experience uh, prior to Escalators. Um, I have a collection out that came out in 2021, Sometimes We're Cruel, of my short fiction. That was my first book. And then last year, my novella Sleep Alone was published. And um, I have short fiction all over the place in all kinds of places. I, I've never counted them up, but um, I have more coming out this year. I also am working on a novel right now, so we'll see if that goes anywhere. But yeah, I've, I've done a little bit of nonfiction too recently and a couple of essays. So it's been really fun to branch out into that. Yeah. Just see where I can go. <laughs> so um, I guess let's talk a little bit about, because, you know, we have a lot of people who, you know, who are either interested in writing or becoming writers or editors who watch the show. Um, what was the process leading into Escalator? Sort of um, like, how did, how did you find out about the project, um, become a part of it? Sort of what's the what was the story there for both of you? Um, uh, Jennifer, if you want to start. Yeah, I, I can go first. Um, so basically, what had happened was um, uh, Mike's uh, Mike is the owner of From Beyond Press, who is the the publisher of Escalators to Hell. He had previously done an anthology of stories about bugs, and he had put a call on Twitter. And a lot of short story writers are really active on Twitter. <laughs> well, or used to, not so much now, but um, it used to be like where 
you could find a lot of the writing community, uh, especially for short stories. And um, he uh, put out a call for slush readers for that project. And I was like, well, I'll give it a try. And uh, so I was a slush reader on that project. And he emailed me after that project was over and said, hey, I really liked the feedback that you did on the stories as a slush reader. Would you ever consider being like a co-editor for something and have a little more creative direction over the project? And I was like, oh yeah, sure, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, he said that his idea was to do an anthology of stories set in the same mall. So his initial idea was that he was gonna do an anthology of stories that were set in a different store in the same mall. Um, and I, I was thinking about it and I was like, yeah, that, that could be interesting. I actually had just tried drafting a story set in an abandoned mall because I was trying to write a Gothic romance that was set in an abandoned mall and using the mall as like a Gothic, a new Gothic setting. So I was already like kind of thinking about that as a theme. So when he came with me to me and said, that's what he wanted to do an anthology of, I was like, oh, that would be really interesting. Um, and then we set up some time to talk about it. And I was like, well, you know, I, I like the idea of it being in one mall and I think that's really cool. But if we're gonna do an open call of submissions sent to us from people around the world, if we keep it in one mall, in one place, in one time, that's gonna be such a headache, <laughs> you know, because I, I, I think like somebody who's in England is not gonna know how to write a story about a mall in, set in the 1980s, you know, in Ohio, right? And, and my perspective was um, I lived abroad for a few years and I served in the Peace Corps in Indonesia and where I lived, there was a guy there, I was in a really rural area, but uh, there was, we were kind of like a few hours away from Jakarta and they built a new mall like a couple hours away. And I remember one of my neighbors in, in the village where I lived saying, the mall is coming closer and closer to us like a monster. <laughs> and that really stuck with me. So, and so when he brought this theme to me, I was like, if we keep it in one place in one time, you lose how the mall means something different to different people. I don't know if that makes sense. And because that, that just him saying that to me, just even to this day, I just remember him saying like, the mall is a monster that's like coming to get us and chase us away and, you know, push our lifestyle and our traditions away. So I, I wanted, I was suggested maybe we open it up and we don't specifically put it in one mall in one place. And we say like, just small themes because I feel like there's so many different ways that people could have taken it. And I didn't want to like limit it so much um, to just one place in one time period. Like, Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. I think, all right. Our experiences kind of across the spectrum can be so different. Um, like yeah. you said, depending on what country you're from, um, what era you grew up in. Yeah. I mean, even if you were like grew up in the sixties and you think of a mall, it means a lot different than somebody, you know, who is like, a Gen Z and now is like seeing the death of, you know, so I, I felt like we, and I'd also felt like, you know, if we kept it to just one setting and like one store per story, like just going through submissions and trying to get the, a good enough story for each store, it would just be such a headache, <laughs> you know, and it would be such a specific thing that would also be unfair to the writers. Cause it would be like, well, write this really specific story but then where else do you submit it if, you know, if we don't accept it? So I was, you know, trying to kind of bring in like, because my experience was being on the other end of submitting stories to be like, why don't we make this a little more friendly to our submitters? Um, and we had a lot of talks about it. And um, then we came up with the idea and he, uh, he sent me a nonfiction book to read about the history of malls, which also um, was really helpful. It was called Meet Me by the Fountain, which is a really good, nonfiction book about the history of malls in the US. Um, and so then we kind of came up with the concept of being like, okay, let's, let's kind of come up with a little bit of prompt to help writers of different directions where they could take this and, you know, like set up, you know, when we were going to open for submissions for how long, you know, what our word count was and things like that. But, and then who our invited authors would be. So. Yeah. Sounds like you were very mindful on like, the, walking sort of that fine line be, between like having like a general prompt or being like too leading. Yeah. Well, that's why I didn't want to like tell people what 
to write because I feel like if you tell people what to write, then why don't you just write it yourself? You know, <laughs> like, you know, um, but so, but I also like wanted it to be focused, like, okay, we're talking about malls. We're not talking about marketplaces. I don't want your D and D story in a marketplace. You know, we're t you know, we're talking about yeah. malls, which is a nebulous concept, but you know, you, you want to keep it to, a, to that, you know, setting kind of, um, but interpreted kind of broadly. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of the prompt, so JW, so when you, how did you come across this prompt and, and become involved in um, writing for it? Well, Jennifer and Mike invited me to do this project, and um, I thought it was a really cool idea. I don't think I've ever written a story in a mall before, and I really appreciate, too, what Jennifer said about you know, her perspective being that we leave the concept of the mall a little more open because of that, you know, the anthology is full of stories from, you know, malls in other countries besides the U.S. Mm -hmm. and what they look like. And that definitely made it a lot easier. It gave me as a writer the freedom to set, you know, my story in a decaying small town mall, you know, that had basically hadn't really changed for decades. And um, it gave me a chance to just, you know, put in a tiny part of my life into it like I like to do and kind of left that door open for me to describe the mall I remember from growing up, the one that, you know, made an impression on me for being so different from other malls. Because when I was in high school, we lived in a little farm town. And, um, you know, it was just, it, this town had so few people, yet it had a mall. And the mall had one department store and the rest of the mall was local shops and the food court had literally a snack stand and that, you know, and folding chairs, that was the whole food court of this mall. And that's where my story takes place. And I'd never <laughs> seen or heard of another mall like that before. So it was a really fun prompt to, you know, to be asked, do you want to write about a mall? And me going, I immediately know what mall I'm writing about. You know? <laughs> well, it's so funny to see how you described it just from your experience. And then um, I made sure to reread it before we got on to talk. That was, I was, and it's like that, that description is exact in, in the way you described it in the story. Yeah, so it, it's kind of funny because um, I lived in the city for a long time, but we, this farm town is kind of a, it's not really a suburb, but it's near the city, but it, it's very different. It was very much a small farm town with a tiny population. And now last I checked, the population of that town has grown over 10 times. And they have like a real mall and they have all the chain stores and all the restaurants. And it's just wild to me because it was literally when I was growing up, it had a McDonald's. It had that little mall and that was about it, you know, and everything was, you know, it was a small town. Everything was a local business, which is kind of cool, right. you know, now. But when I was a kid growing up, it was where's the movie theater? I I can't get the clothes I see in magazines at, the, you know, at this mall. I have to go to the city if I want to have clothes that I see in magazines and if I want to get music or anything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a lot about your story that I could sort of relate to. I was, you know, I, I grew up growing up on Long Island, but we were sort of in a small town part of Long Island. Not a lot going on. We, you know, we well, honestly, we didn't even have a mall. We had to go, we had to drive uh, pretty far to get to, to the mall. So we had like a little like strip, like shopping center, I guess that's kind of a mall. <laughs> um, but yeah, so what when you sit down to write, um, you know, what is your like general process? Uh, is, uh, you know, maybe specifically, you know, with, with a short like this. I'm pretty much a pantser. I um I kind of just need my character, and I need a starting point. Sometimes I know the end, sometimes I don't. Even if I know the end, it usually ends up changing because the story changes as I write it. So I just, you know, I sat down, I kind of knew my character was going to be someone around my own age with, you know, my own feelings about having to go back to this town and see this mall and how she would react. And, you know, I, I basically described them all. I, you know, talked about something I experienced in my own life, you know, with somebody at the mall and that kind of thing. And, you know, it just kind of evolved from there as to how it would end and what's really going on in this town. Yeah. You know, as a, um, something that really spoke to me uh, in reading your story, you know, um, not as a female reader, but, a, but as a queer reader, um, reading it in sort of that small town 
growing up experience as a queer person, sort of like the first loves and and then sort of how you wrapped it up into how a lot of how a lot of us feel about going back to our hometowns. There were some like really beautiful themes that you weave together there um, that really s sort of jumped out. So I just wanted to sort of really applaud you on that. <laughs> well, thank <laughs> it, you. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I, I'm totally, I'm a writer of ego in a lot of ways. I just write what I feel and, you know, yeah. old feelings come up and I just write what I literally know in a lot of ways, you know, and then exaggerate that quite a bit. Yeah. 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 Don't want to get too into into into, into spoilers because I want people to read this. Um, but but I really love the themes that you were going on that you were exploring here uh, for sure. Um, but but speaking of process, uh, Jennifer, I sort of want to uh, pivot over to you. And what was your um, your process when when you sat down to really tackle editing all of these different stories um, together? Um, so we we had um, just to give a little bit of. We, we had a, so we had our five invited authors mm -hmm. um, and we, we tried to look for people that had different styles and, you know, like different so that we would get like a, a pretty, um, even from the invited authors that we would get like some different, you know, perspectives in there. Um, but then from the open call that we had, that was open for about a month, a little over a month, we got 261 or 262 stories. Um, so we picked uh, what, like uh, 17 out of those. Um, so, um, so the first we started with just, you know, like picking, you know, going through all those stories and just picking what, what would work. Um, so that during that process, you know, with talking to Mike and us talking about the stories, we kind of started to pick up on certain themes, you know, that like, you know, definitely you, you just have some themes in your head of like, Oh, I want to see some stories that have a neo-gothic kind of feel or something, you know, with teenagers, obviously it's a mall or something like with growing up um, or you want to see stuff that has perspectives of mall malls as monsters or malls, something from the perspective of the mall itself, you know, and we want to, I, at least for me, I wanted a mix of stories where the mall wasn't just the evil place, but it also could be a, you know, a good place for people. Like I wanted a mix of, ideas but as you start you know getting submissions and you'll see certain themes like popping up over and over and over again and um so then you start to get the idea of like okay what how is this resonating with people and so what are the things that we can bring out that give that bring out those themes in the best way and with like the best variety to kind of play off each other um and then once we had kind of picked our stories and gotten people to say yes they 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 want to be in it then it's like, well, what, you know, what order do I put this in? And, um, you know, we, you kind of go back and forth of being like, if, uh, if I'm a reader, you know, kind of how do you balance? Like, okay, this story was really sad. Why don't we put something in that's maybe a little bit more short or charming to kind of not, <laughs> you don't want people to totally be like, okay. <laughs> like, you know, because it's hard to say how someone's going to read it. They might just jump around in the book or they might go from, from start to finish. So if they are going from start to start to finish, you kind of want to, you know, balance some of the feelings and some of the, the styles so that you don't have like all of the sad stories at the end. And, you know, like yeah. emotional um, ebbs and flows. right? Yeah. <laughs> and we did have, I think we did do a good job of putting in a, a, a lot of mix tonally um, <laughs> of different, you know, like some things that are way more lighthearted and other things that, you know, are, you know, a lot more um, sad and or scary. <laughs> so um, but I'd want to, at least what we wanted kind of to like balance it a little bit. So you're not throwing too much at somebody at once. Um, yeah. I mean, it's sort of the fun thing with um, the horror genre in general, right? I think a lot of like casual horror fans don't even realize like all the different sub genres and emotional yeah. uh, turns and all, all the things that you can sort of explore within it. Um, so I sort of wanted to ask, like, w were the both of you, big horror fans prior to writing prior to this particular anthology um what's your history with horror whether um written or on the screen uh J jw why don't we start with you? um i i was a very fearful kid but i always wrote scary stuff and i think it's probably just you know my way of coping and trying to control my own fear absolutely so i 
I mean, like I've been writing since I was little and I always wrote weird kind of horror adjacent stuff. And I remember growing up reading a lot of Stephen King, of course, you know, and Anne Rice. And, um, you know, I had a an older friend when I was a little kid and she was my neighbor and she loved horror movies. So we'd go over there after school and watch movies at her house, which was fun. And, you know, my husband's actually a huge horror movie fan. So it's kind of funny to um, go over the years. And I used to be very squeamish. Like I loved horror, but gore was really difficult for me. Sure. And I've been completely desensitized now. I'm just like, fuck it, the blood, goo. You know? <laughs> yeah, let's see some organs. I want to describe the organs. <laughs> so that's kind of been my evolution. I think it's always been in my life. And my parents are very cool in that they never limited, you know, the media I consume. They were you know, fine with what I watched. I remember seeing Poltergeist way too young and being terrified of skeletons for years. Like skeletons was a thing that just scared me so much. So I love that you brought up Poltergeist because that is Angel and mine's, that's our favorite movie. Oh. Uh, that's actually how I met Angel through, through Twitter. Um, and we bonded over our love of Poltergeist. Um, I actually have a tattoo from it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hallway ghost. It's it's just oh, but talking about oh. like a like um a movie, but like it's about the horror genre, right? But it's it's also such like a touching family story, right? Yeah, as well, right? Um, but yeah, it tends to be a lot of people's first horror movie for some reason, and I, I love finding that out. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wonder if in the era when it came out, I mean, I, I don't know, but I kind of wondered if maybe it was considered more of a respectable horror movie. And that's why so many more people watched it who necessarily weren't into horror. And that's sure. why it's so widely known and loved. I mean, it was like yeah, written and produced by Spielberg. I yeah. mean, it was done the same time as um, E.T., so, like, it sort of was in that vein of, like, yeah, like, E.T., Poltergeist, Goonies, right? It was all those sort of, like, family yeah. movies, but were also sort of, like, a little on the edgier side. Yeah, I think definitely. And I think that definitely attracted, you know, like, our parents and stuff, maybe, to kind of be like, oh, okay, that's this sounds good. We know this director. And, you know, maybe they might have even liked it a little. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jennifer, what about you? Um, You know what? I... And not until a few years ago would I consider my pers myself a horror person. I think when I was a kid, I definitely identified as like a sci-fi kid. Like I, oh, I sure, yeah. you know, I, I was obsessed with Animorphs <laughs> as a, a 90s kid. And oh, I man. Devoured Animorphs. all those. But looking back, there was a lot of horrific stuff in Animorphs. But, I, you know, I was, I was such a big Godzilla fan, too. Like, you know, my... Um, my grandpa used to buy me these Godzilla toys. <laughs> like you one, right? Yeah, so I used oh. to, I was just um, a very big monster fan, you know, um, um, but not necessarily like I never really got into slashers too much mm -hmm. or um, that, that style of horror. Um, but then, you know, I, I realized, you know, was, as I started writing speculative fiction that like horror does have a bigger definition than just like you know a slasher or so um and even for me i i guess i can relate to jen that i wasn't a big gore person but now that i've read more horror i'm more a little more desensitized to the body horror and i can like really appreciate it especially because i do like biological sci-fi stuff like the ways that that can go and um oh, yeah so I, I think I've always liked weird, like, I, you know, I responded to like Twilight Zone. So things that are more, I think the horror that I gravitate to more is like stuff that's a little more weird um, or like creepy than it is necessarily like totally in your face. Um, it, but uh, like, obviously I do love a great monster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, don't worry, this wasn't sort of like uh, yeah. check your like uh, horror fan uh, ID card. <laughs> for the yeah. You didn't <laughs> pass the test. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, but I just, yeah, I was like, I just, I love because like, I, I don't think people like really realize like horror is so sort of like it's it, it's so fluid um, yeah. because you can get like a gothic romance that sort of has those elements to it, or um, like science fiction for sure. Like, I'm. Uh, my husband and I really like Star Trek, so I think of like some of the stuff that the Borgs did. I'm like, that's some pretty, pretty creepy stuff there, right? 
Um, so it certainly can sort of have a brand. I mean, look at the Twilight books and those movies. I mean, that was horror. Technically, it's horror, but it's 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 romance, yeah. right? I mean, I was also a huge Batman kid, so I think a lot of Batman is like that more horror flavor to it too. Yeah. So. Oh, man. <laughs> So, yeah, no, those some of those Batman villains. I'm like, ooh, okay, <laughs> nightmare fuel. <laughs> yeah. Um, what were maybe some of the challenges in the process? Um, whether um in the editing or in the writing, you know, I mean writer's block, so it could be a real thing too. Um, I forgot who I who I who I sort of uh <laughs> left off with, but um JW, why don't we go, <laughs> go with you? <laughs> Um, I think for me in this story, once I knew the ending I wanted to do, I'm a very descriptive person. I very much indulge myself in describing things because that's the part of writing that gives me a lot of pleasure. And I really, you know, kind of went off at the ending of the story. And luckily, I had several friends look at it and, you know, everyone kind of agreed. And one friend in particular really pushed me to be like, you know, why don't you remove this you know you don't really need all this description and I think that's where I get in my own way a lot is I just want to tell you everything and I really want to make sure you know what it looks like and what it feels like instead of you know maybe leaving it on a more elegant note so that was definitely my challenge with that story is learning where to edit and where to pull back mm -hmm. I think you said you're a Stephen King fan yeah I was growing up yeah, yeah. Because he could be pretty descriptive with a lot of things. I'm yeah. wondering if there's some King influence. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so subconsciously, actually. I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. because he could be very sort of, I don't want to say long-winded because that sort of has a negative connotation. Because mm -hmm. some people really sort of love getting like, so, you know, really indulgent in with the description. But I, I guess it's a little different if you're doing long form versus like a short story, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, that's where I use up all my word count. So that's something I definitely have been learning over the years is to when to pull back, when to realize your words are very limited and carry a lot of weight, you know, so you need to kind of to make them shine. You need to cut some of those things. I, I've learned to kill my darlings, basically, which is still very, very hard for me. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure a lot of people can relate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jennifer, what about in the editing process? Any, any challenges um, that came your way? I mean, uh, once we had the stories picked, I don't think it was that challenging, really. I mean, with anything, there's always, when you read a story, you're, you're like, is this the author's intent versus is it a mistake? And, you know, knowing what to correct or not correct. And, you know, especially with some of, like, some of our writers are, you know, really accomplished, you know, like Jen and um, have a really long wonderful resume and so it can be a little nerve-wracking to maybe go back to them and be like maybe you want to cut this out because it's you know because you're like well who am I to tell this person not to do it you know <laughs> so you have a little you got to be a little um sorry my dog just came home <laughs> but, um so it, it's a little bit like having a little faith in your own editorial vision to say you know wait I do think that the story this might need to be cut or this might be um maybe not be working or at least open up that discussion um but i think initially the hardest thing was just picking the stories because you get down to you know the top 20 25 percent and they're all really great stories but you can't take them all and and having been on the other side of it as a writer it, it's like oh yeah i'm gonna have to reject these people that put their heart into this and then you can read it and tell like they really put so much of themselves into it and they, it is a really good story but you know you just can't take all of them and that's just like you just feel like you want to tell the person like but you don't want to be inappropriate but you want to be like no this is really good and it did move me I just couldn't take it and you know and and um I you know I don't want you to feel bad that you you know, I could tell this you know so much of your heart went into this but <laughs> No, please. It's not you. It's me. You know. Um, yeah. But so I think that's that's it. Because there were there were a few stories that we had to say no to that I still I still think about, and I think they are great stories. They just you know you, you just had to it just wasn't going to work out. So it's the like 
creative part of the brain and then the business part of the brain, right? Yeah. The business part of the brain, you know, it's like, you can you, I mean, realistically, you could only fit so many stories in, in, into one book. And it is hard. Sort of it's, it's on your own version of the kill your darlings conundrum that Jay was yeah. talking about. <laughs> exactly. and, or even like, you know, there are certain things where it's like a compromise too, because there's two of us. So there might be some story that I really fell in love with, but I know Mike didn't really like. So we, it's kind of a little bit of a compromise of like, well, all right, I pushed for this story, but I can't, I can't take over the whole thing and make it, you know, because we have to work together and I have to trust yeah. that he sees something in this that maybe I don't, you know, and vice versa. Exactly. Uh, right. Right. Um, a question that I love to ask um, is, so I'm going to turn this to JAW. What, what do you hope people feel when they read your story? I hope they feel that they can relate whether that's, you know, a good thing or a bad thing. I guess I kind of hope people feel seen that maybe they pick up within the story, the emotions that were behind it or, you know, just, um, and, and they can recognize it and be like, I felt that way too. I remember when I was 16, I had, you know, I felt that way. And, um, I, I mean, I feel like I could say that a lot about a lot of my work, you know, cause so much of it, comes from a personal place, whether it's an experience I had or just a feeling that I decided to expand on. And I think I've learned over the years of doing this that a lot of people feel the same things that I do and that I did. And um, sometimes you just, it means a lot when you read something. I know it means a lot to me when I read something and I recognize something in that and I see a piece of myself from my own experience that it's a rush, it's, it's a comfort it stings a little to be seen in a mm. way when you're reading something, you know, you feel a little vulnerable, but yeah. it just really makes you realize that, you know, you thought whether you thought something was wrong with you or whatever, just knowing other people related, it's a, it's a big comfort. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the power of storytelling right there, right? It's being yeah. able to connect to others. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, as an editor, right. Um, what do you hope people feel in reading this collection of stories? Um, I mean, I think I think similar to to Jen, I hope that they, you know, they they find something where they they can connect to it. Um, I mean, I think horror, like obviously horror, is can be really dark and can be depressing. But I think, you know, one of the reasons why haunted house stories are so popular is because the house is where you're supposed to be safe, so you kind of break that safety. And in a way, like the nostalgia that we have maybe for shopping malls and even the, the concept of a mall was supposed to be this safe place to protect you from, you know, the evils of downtown <laughs> or, you know, and it was supposed to be this safe place for teenagers to go. But in a way there was, even though it was supposed to be this safe place, there there was kind of an insidious, it's insidiousness <laughs> to it in the sense that, you know, it, it, originally malls were made to keep certain people out and to, you know, to promote a certain kind of lifestyle that not everybody had access to. And so I think when you pick up on the horrors of these things, you're, you're kind of allowing people to, to look at their relationship with their own nostalgia and maybe their own growing up or, or their own, the way their life, or maybe for people from places where malls are more of a new thing to kind of grapple with their feelings about what it means to have their lives change, whether it means saying goodbye to malls or saying mm -hmm. hello to them, you know, like it, it just, I think it can kind of help people explore complicated feelings on, you know, something that, isn't necessary that can be good and bad, you know, and you might have mixed, you know, I don't know if that <laughs> makes sense, but absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's funny. I know I I know I mentioned sort of at the beginning of the interview uh, that I'm a social worker and something that we talk about a lot um for clients is um uh, the concept of the the third home mm -hmm. is like this a uh, place that you can go to. You know, and we're sort of seeing the death of that these days, um, not just like the death of malls in America, but like just the concept of the third place. Like you have, you know, home and school or home and work. And then where else do you go? You mm -hmm. know, if you're a kid that's not in sports or a kid that's not in a particular club, what do you do with your life? Right. And then we find so many kids sort of like 
I don't know, get into trouble or what, or not. Or, I, mean, I, I feel like I sound like such a crotchy old man by saying, but, um, but like, but it's also like, it's a support, right. For people like finding a community, finding like just that place. I mean, I think, you know, um, the way we all, we've all been talking about malls is like, we all have sort of very speci specific, unique experiences, whether it's like going on a date to the mall, hanging out with friends in the mall, um, you know, all positive or negative. Um, and I think that, the anthology as a whole really um as a reader for me really encapsulates that very well yeah no def definitely i do i do think there is a lot of growing mall nostalgia nostalgia <laughs> that you yeah. that you've seen pop up not you know like you know people famously they talk about strangers thing stranger thing had a whole season that ended in the mall and yeah the Last of Us also had the whole episode in the abandoned mall. So I think mall nostalgia is going to keep popping up more and more. But I do think it is maybe related to what you're saying, that there's this a little bit of loss of that third space and people are kind of grappling with their feelings on that, you know, and, and what is what does that mean? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, these past few years, right? So many people working from home, right? So now it's like a lot of people don't even go to an office. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, like, where do people kind of congregate? Um, so I think that nostalgia is definitely, it's interesting. I know we're both New Yorkers, Jennifer. Are you, do you know, uh, actually you're in the Cal Palisades Mall. Yep. Yep. yep, yep, yep. So yeah. <laughs> it's so interesting to see like so many of the stores that are going out mm -hmm. um, and they're really turning into more like, experiential sort of yes yeah. yeah you know like whether it's vr arcades or mini golf or a go-kart thing or escape rooms like i think there's sort of this need for something a little different and maybe those sorts of experiences might reboot yeah, maybe. the mall experience i, don't well, know. I also think there's like a when malls go through stages, it's like they'll start out with like luxury stores and then you'll get mm -hmm. stuff that's like more affordable and then you'll start to get stuff where you're like, what are they even selling? <laughs> you know, and then like you would notice when the mall really starts to die, it's like stuff that's like as seen on TV versus, <laughs> you know, like, no. and like stores where does that for sure. <laughs> Who, who's actually buying this? So, it, you know, it, 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 it is interesting how malls go through like these different economic and sociological kind of demographic changes and store changes and um but yeah I'll, I'll plug that book meet me by the fountain again but she talks a lot about that and like how certain communities have like reclaimed them all and reclaimed it with different styles of food court that are much more mm -hmm. like that are you know with better food and than they were in the past so it, it is it is possible that a lot of these mall spaces are going to get reclaimed and kind of repurposed which is probably a good thing yeah. I know the um, what's the what, what is, is the not not the um the Mall of America, but the one in Jersey. Yeah, um, the one that they just built that's new. That has a lot of interesting stuff because they have like Nickelodeon has like a water park in there. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard. I haven't gone like, yet. But... It's like an amusement park in there, but the the food court. Um, something I notice is uh, a lot of the restaurants are um, a lot more culturally diverse too. Yes, I think yep. like there's like ramen shops and like. Halal and a whole bunch of so I think that's also a big component of like because yeah. you guys are both bringing up like who is the mall catering to right mm -hmm. yeah definitely no yeah. do you do you both still go to malls um I not super often but every once in a while yeah actually after after reading two hundred and sixty mall stories. Like eighty percent of them mentioned Orange Julius, which I've never had before. So it's my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I never had an orange. Okay, maybe not eighty percent. The ones that were not from America did not mention. So eighty percent of the ones from like America or Canada, I feel like mentioned Orange Julius. So a lot of Orange Julius. <laughs> I think yours might have mentioned it, Jen. So I don't. You might have briefly meant had an Orange Julius. You I don't did. Know if I did. Did I? Yeah. I know you I've did. been asked. What I yeah. love about them all, and I know I said orange Julius because I miss it. <laughs> and you know, I yeah, I had never had one, so I looked up where I could get an orange Julius. <laughs> so I drew. <laughs> I ended up me and my um, fiance. We drove like forty five minutes to somewhere in New Jersey <laughs> that had an orange Julius. So, and it was funny because I hadn't been to a mall in like a few months, 
and I walked in and it was actually super crowded that I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, that's, that's really interesting. And, you know, we, we got our orange Julius and, you know, it was, it was, it was a drink. <laughs> 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 was it worth driving 45 minutes for <laughs> well for not for the taste of the thing but just to like satisfy my curiosity yes like i just, yeah. just needed to know <laughs> i'm gonna have all the orange was. julius fans in the comments now <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i have to wonder it's been so long since i've had one i kind of wonder if i'd be disappointed you know if i i wouldn't like it now the way i loved it as a kid Maybe, yeah. It was very. It tastes like an orange creamsicle. I guess is the mm -hmm. the flavor it was going for. Which yeah, some of those I, things, right? We sort of like with the nostalgia goggles, or in this case, nostalgia mm -hmm. taste buds. I don't know. <laughs> I do like. I did get a great American cookie afterwards because I for, I really mm -hmm. like their sugar cookies. I don't know what they put in it, and I know that like other people are like these are awful. Like, but for some reason, I just really like the great American cookie. <laughs> So it was the pretzels for me. Oh, the anti ant, yeah, those. The anti ant pretzels, yep. amazing. Those were, they had that cinnamon <laughs> on them. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. JW, do you do you still frequent the mall sometimes where you're at? It's kind of funny because um, the malls around me have really died. Yeah. Like they've lost their flagship stores and stuff. And um, I was thinking, I, I thought it was really interesting that Jennifer brought up about how you know the malls start with luxury stores. And then kind of end up at the, you know, a scene on TV store. And I've literally seen that happen here where I live. Yeah. You know, you start with this mall that is very aspirational to maybe what they hope the neighborhood will be like. And then over the years, it starts reflecting what the neighborhood is actually like. And now that mall is basically at least 50% empty. It's a ghost town. You know, the luxury stores are gone. It's, you know, the as seen on TV store, the food court's gone. So, I mean, and I've seen that at the few malls around me. There's only one kind of halfway between where my parents live now and where I live. There's actually what I call the fancy mall. And mm -hmm. it's amazing. I I wonder if the rest of the country, if their malls look like this, because it's got like really good restaurants in it, really good stores. The place is beautiful. You know, a hundred movie screens. It's just, it's just probably the nicest mall I've ever seen. So it just kind of made me wonder if, you know, maybe the malls around me aren't reflective of the rest of the country. But, you know, then you kind of look at the mall book and you realize, okay, we're all kind of in a state of decay, you know, in one way or in the other. No matter where you are in this country, there is a shopping center that is decaying near you. Yeah. We, you know, we still have the West, Westchester, yeah, which is pretty fancy. Oh, the Westchester Mall, yeah. yes. Yes, that one's um, White Plains? Yep, yeah. Because right. it has a Tesla store and a Rolex and a... <laughs> I mean, that's like the fancy mall. But then, but then, but then you, yeah, then you think about like neighborhoods, right? Like, you know, very affluent maybe privileged neighborhoods probably have like a mall kind of like that mm -hmm. um where you look maybe a little more rural areas that's where you're probably seeing a lot of the decaying shopping centers mm -hmm. i'm actually very curious to read that book that you're talking about jennifer <laughs> yeah. well, i will i was it was good but i will warn you that the first half is a lot of name dropping architects oh. um so it gets a little more interesting in the second half unless you're really big into architecture which maybe you are but um, it is. It is a I am, but I'll overall. Take a blog through it. <laughs> <laughs> it is. A, it, I. I do. I don't want to. It is a really good book overall, and she she did a really comprehensive job. But I do warn you that if you're not a big architecture buff, like the first half, you might want to like kind of skim through because it is a lot of just like this style, and it's hard if you're not like an architecture person, like picturing that you know without a pay. <laughs> At least for me, I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> they had to do a lot of like supplementary googling. Yeah, you would have to, but I mean, the second, the like the the end of the book, she gets more into like the sociological and like economic discussion, which for me was a little bit easier to, you know, like get a yeah. hold on and yeah, but yeah, well, I'll, I'll I'll ask um I'll remind you to send me the the, the title or just remind me of the title. I'll write it down because I'll I'll put that um okay in the yeah. description below along with like links for everything. So I'm gonna do that sort of cliche sort of wrap up <laughs> thing of where can everybody find yes. you and. <laughs> Yes. Uh, JW, why don't we, we'll start with you. Um, I'm at jwmccarthy.com. That you can see all my recent work there and what I've done. I'm also on Twitter. Um, 
these days you have to be like on every social media site, the way everything is just splintered off. I've mm -hmm. been on all of them at one point. I can't keep up. I'm mostly on Twitter, even though I don't know. Obviously, it's not the most pleasant place to be, but I can't. It's an interesting situation can't, there, yeah. Yeah, I can't split my brain anymore. I mean, I have <laughs> the other accounts, but I'm rarely there. I just don't remember often to check in. I try to, but yeah. So if you want to catch me, it's usually going to be on Twitter, or if you just want to learn more, jwmccarthy.com. Fantastic. Uh, and Jennifer? Yeah, so I have a, I have a, um, my website is Jennifer Jean, so, but Jean spelled the French way. And then my last name, McArdle, um, at blogspot.com. Um, and I'm also on Twitter and Blue Sky um, with, it's, my handle is McArdle, and then Jean, again, spelled like J-E-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. So, yeah, that's where you guys can find me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and but, where can um, our viewers pick up a copy um, of Escalators to Help? So if you go to frombeyondpress.com, you can buy directly from the publisher and he would really appreciate that. <laughs> um, but it also is available on with a lot of uh, other booksellers like Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, yeah, I think and, uh, other like major booksellers too. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much uh, for meeting with me and talking about this book. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was great to get to talk to you and both of you and talk about the book. Yeah. yeah. And to our viewers, thank you so much again for checking us out. We will see you next time. Take care.